This is Orsi, official old guy at oldguytalkstome.com, a podcast dedicated to helping older guys create kick-ass lives for themselves and those that they love. It's for women, too. Each week, I bring you a special guest to help you create that life that you imagine for yourself and those that you love. We talk anti-aging medicine, personal growth, relationships, and sex, vices, and other topics that many don't want to talk about but need to. Just because you're getting older doesn't mean you have to be old. Also, if you want to know three ways to get laid more frequently without begging, go to oldguytalks.com and opt in. When you do, you're going to get my informative video on three simple things you can do to get laid more frequently without begging so you don't have to turn in your man card. And ladies, you may want your man to know these things because I think you'll like it too. Additionally, you'll be notified weekly when a new podcast episode is ready for you to consume. Periodically, I will share with you other stuff that will help you create that life that you want for yourself and those that are important to you. Don't want to miss anything? Be sure to subscribe, share, and review this podcast. Did you know that there are 76 additives that have been approved by the FDA that can be added to wines? You want a wine with shit in it that may not be good for you? Well, there is an option for wines that have been produced naturally, organically, that have been tested, that have no sugar. And when they don't have any sugar, that means that they're ketosis and intermittent fasting friendly. These wines have been produced with a great deal of care on small farms and are available to you. How do you get them? Find out by going to www.oldguytalks.com backslash dry farms dry farms all one word with an s and find out more and with your initial order you can get a bottle for one penny that's right a bottle for one penny and they taste great they taste great don't wait don't hesitate don't procrastinate get those wines now this is Orsi, the official old guy from oldguytalksme.com, a podcast dedicated to helping older guys create kick-ass lives for themselves and those that they love. And part of that is, well, what you put in your mouth. Now, I'm not talking about the cigar that I'm normally uh, hanging around with. I'm talking about food, 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 food. And today I've got lucky with me. I have David Page, who is the author of Food Americana, which is something we're going to talk about. But he's a two-time Emmy winner. He's changed the world of food television by creating, developing, and executive producing the groundbreaking show Diner, Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. Before that, as a network news producer based in London, Frankfurt, and Budapest, he traveled Europe, Africa, and the Middle East doing two things, covering some of the biggest stories in the world and developing a passion for some of the world's most incredible foods. Paige walked through Checkpoint Charlie and into East Berlin the night the Berlin Wall opened, but his favorite memory of the eastern side before unification remains the Weiss, Weisswurst, that's going to be a hard, be a hard one to say, sold under the S-Bahn elevated train. He was he was first served couscous by Muammar Gaddafi's kitchen staff while waiting in a tent to interview the dictator in Libya. The man had blood oranges at 3 o'clock in the morning with Yasser Arafat. Once back in the States, he pursued his passion both personally and professionally, producing Good Morning America shows. He was involved in a substantial amount of food coverage, including cooking segments by Emeril Lagasse, creating diners, drive-ins, and dives, and hands-on producing its first 11 seasons took him deep into the world of American food and its vast variations. His next series, The Syndicated Beer and Geeks, dove deep into the intersection of great beer and great food. He's the author of Food Americana, which is what is the most important thing. Oh, okay. So that's my introduction. Howdy. Nicely Howdy. done. Thank you. Thank you. You almost thank you. said vice versa correctly. I almost said vice versa. I, I will I will try that. Um uh, it's I'll, a I'll great that. white sausage. Oh yeah. Yeah. Phenomenal. I, I, I think that's 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 a that's a word you need to practice while drinking scotch. Uh, or, or, or good beer. German or, beer. Good German or good, beer. Or good German that's beer. Fine. All right. So so David, I the first thing I want to ask you is what's the most important thing you've done today today yes and the most oh that's a darn good question well i'm working on my next book so i did a couple of interviews that mattered okay all right 
Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, that's always a, that's always a it's, it's, it's a startling question. Well, to actually, no. From a food perspective, the best thing I, I did today is I brought the package into the kitchen that had been delivered by Zabar's, the famed purveyor of Jewish food in New York. So that tonight my wife and I can eat lox and bagels and cream cheese and white fish salad. That's the best thing I did today. Okay. <laughs> it's important to take care of your wife. So that's good. And your so, taste buds. That's right. So, uh, David, how'd you develop your interest in food? Well, it, it, it began um, kind of by accident. I, I always like to eat but I never had a particular interest in food as a subject until I moved to Europe to cover Europe, Africa, and the Middle East for NBC News. And suddenly I was in country after country, culture after culture, trying new and different dishes. It became clear to me early on that food afforded a gateway into other cultures and a really good way to meet people from other cultures. And it just clicked with me. I was on the road constantly. I literally, my apartment in Frankfurt, which I had for several years, in Germany, you have to own your kitchen in a rental apartment. I put, I, I went to, uh, it was a new apartment, so I went to Ikea, or Ikea, however you pronounce it, on whatever continent, and bought an entire kitchen and had it installed in my apartment. And several years later, when I moved out, I realized I'd never used it. All of my food knowledge was gained from being someplace else. I brought that back with me to the States and thus fueled, I began looking at the food I was eating in America differently. And eventually through a fortuitous series of bizarre events, I, I moved from news into food journalism. Okay. Well, that's kind of an interesting story. Um, what is the most exotic foods that you've eaten? Most exotic food I've ever eaten? Uh, various innards uh, at a market in, of all places, Flushing, New York, which is in Queens, which sells legitimate that's the wrong word because it gets into a whole discussion of whether or not Chinese American food is legitimate. Let me put it this way. Sells to recent Chinese immigrants foods such as the ones they would eat back home. And yeah. unlike American food culture, Chinese food culture uh, deals A, deeply in a variety of textures, mm -hmm. and B, uh, is nose to tail. As are most cuisines, uh, yeah. at, at their origin anyway, certainly not American. So there was a patty of duck blood, there was some artery, there was um, some tendon, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So that was probably, I mean, in terms of odd or weird, we were in Romania before uh, Ceausescu was deposed at the time he was one of the most repressive dictators in the sure. world. And they had invited some Western press in, us and I guess a few others, to try to show off that they were achieving, that they were succeeding in their communist plan to feed a starving population. And they took us out on one of these dog and pony shows to show us how much protein they were raising and they got us, they took us to this huge uh, corrugated metal building, must have been multiple football fields in size. And we walked inside expecting to shoot cattle. And instead, what we found was the world's largest supply of bunnies. It turned out that they had turned, at least for visual consumption for us, to rabbits as a way to provide protein for the masses. And while theoretically I'm not opposed to rabbit as a food, it has a long history in Europe, sitting down for the obligatory visitor's banquet to dine on what my cameraman referred to as all of those cute Easter bunnies, that did not go down easily. <laughs> I'm just thinking about that walking in and seeing a bunch of rabbits. It I, was I, immense. 
was it was it because they they procreate so rapidly? I mean, I'm guessing. What... Um, I, I'm guessing. Uh, although I think you could probably make a, an argument that you get more protein per pound off a cow, but uh, yeah, I I yeah. was things look Romania in the day. I don't know what it's like today. Was one of the strangest places on earth. So this sure. did not particularly surprise me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not a big fan of rabbit. This it just seems like a lot of work, and not, there's not a lot of meat on a rabbit bone. Well, it's like eating I, crab. Give me a lobster, I can at least grab a tail. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, so you're 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 in foreign countries, and you you, you eat uh, food there. How do you decide? Because you know, in America, we're so used to everything being so uh, clean, so homogenized, so uh, standardized, and everything else in a lot of different ways. So, how do you decide when you're in a foreign country whether to buy that food from that vendor on the street? Oh, street vendors! Clearly, if you're in the third world uh -huh. um, and you have any concerns about the purity of the food supply, street food's the only way to go. Because oh, really? what you see with street food uh, is a piece of protein being cooked, i.e. purified, over a flame in front of you. Mm -hmm. I would be much more concerned in, in many places about the salad they're serving me at the Western Hotel. Okay. Pardon me, uh, I'm losing a throat loss inch there. Okay, no problem. Uh Really? Because most yeah. of the time we're kind of kind of wary about the source of that. No, you if that. you see it being cooked, it's being cooked. I mean, they're going to kill whatever's on it. Um, and secondly, you know, I, I was I worked internationally for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And with the caveat that in non-Western countries, you really did have to not drink the water mm -hmm. or the ice that was made out of that water or eat the salad that was washed in that water. I only got sick twice. Really? Um, you know, so uh, I had a British cameraman who, whenever we went to some place considered exotic, the first thing he would do was take a drink of tap water because his position was that we Americans had no immunity to anything because we'd never eaten anything to build up an immunity. Yeah. And he never got sick. Yeah. I Although there, there was the time at the Cairo airport that I saw them reef uh, furtively refilling bottled water bottles from the tap for sale. Oh uh, yeah. Well, I think there's, there's a lot of truth to that, uh, that we don't have our immune systems challenged properly uh, to, to handle things. Cause uh, I know that when I was in, uh, I was in Tanzania oh, this was many years ago, about 15 years ago. Um, and we were doing the, went up Mount Kilimanjaro, but you know, nice. all the, all, all the porters that carry your stuff, they're drinking from the stream. You know, we got, we got our bottles with our filters and our tablets and all that stuff and blah, blah, blah. And, and they're just drinking, you know, it's nothing bad, nothing wrong. And they, they don't get sick or anything. So it was kind of an interesting, you know, in our lack thing. of protection, I assume I'm not a scientist, but I'd love someone to investigate this. We've all been bathing in Purell for a year. I yeah, would like yeah. to see what happens when this finally recedes and we, we have the, um, the result of our Purell infatuation to deal with. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think some people, some people will recover and others will not. Others will, con will continue to, uh, to have that, uh, that paranoia. Uh, so, I, uh, you know, I, I'm not... I don't fall into that group. Uh, I did get my vaccinations and all that stuff, but I didn't really, uh, I'm not, the, the, from, the mortality rate is pretty, even though we had lots of people die, uh, most of them were, had pre-existing conditions and things like that, so. Well, I, I, I was completely vaccinated when I got COVID. Uh -huh. uh, then I got it again with pneumonia. So, oh, wow. um, not to get political, but I really wish people would get vaccinated so that yeah. they don't host the development of variants, which yeah. clearly are what got me. Yeah. That's amazing. Twice. Oh yeah. The pneumonia was the best part. Oh yeah. yeah. You always want to get pneumonia. That's it's, it's kind of like a, a side dish. To the, yeah, to no, the absolutely. It's, it's like red beans without rice. You got to have the pneumonia. <laughs> got the pneumonia. So you had the, some pretty interesting dinners 
so tell me about your uh, having uh, dinner with Muammar Gaddafi. Well, Gaddafi didn't come to that dinner. Oh, he didn't come to that dinner. No, 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 no. He they they kept the press corps at bay by feeding us. It was the first time I ever had couscous, and then they said go away. Now I did end up scoring a one on one with Gaddafi that that was kind of interesting. Shortly thereafter, okay. Uh, we we you, I don't know if you recall the United States bombed Gaddafi, one of Gaddafi's houses. Yeah, was it was a house or some tents? I can't no, remember. it was a house. It was, <laughs> was a house. house. The, the, the tents are for show. Uh, <laughs> this was a house, and. Somehow I got the first interview with them after the bombing and they brought me in and I had to have the tour. The high point of which was that and what they purported was his bedroom was a round um, U Hefner style bed mm -hmm. done in crushed fake blue velvet with what appeared to be stereo controls in the arms. Uh, I, I then went ahead to have my interview with him. And Gaddafi spoke perfect English, but for political reasons, he would often pretend not to. And you'd have to go through the translator, which would slow stuff down, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, at the end of the substantive part of the interview, and don't don't misconstrue this as in any way being negative toward people who choose to cross dress or anything like that. But at that time, the New York Post had run a, a front page story with a mocked up picture of Gaddafi dressed like a woman. And the content of the story was that the CIA had released or secretly released information that Gaddafi, A, used a lot of psychotropic drugs and B, liked to cross-dress. Okay. So we get to the end of the interview and I'm going through the interpreter and I finally figure what the hell. And I say, one final question. The New York Post says you like to dress up in women's clothing. Is that true? And the interpreter looks at me like, I'm out of my mind. He's not going to ask this question. And then Gaddafi, because he understands everything, breaks out laughing. And then he blames, you know, it's a Zionist plot, blah, blah, blah. But no, he he, he broke out laughing, uh, even as his translator would not give him the question in Arabic. <laughs> So I, I, I imagine that the, the, the translator was worried about maybe getting shot right there in the spot. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Although, yeah. I, you know, and this is uh, this is kind of a, an aside to most of the topics we're dealing with. But one of the, the things when you're doing journalism overseas, if you're in a translator situation, after you come back, you have to have an independent translator take a look at what was said. Because often the questions and answers bear no relationship to the interview you conducted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been in a business situation like that, and, uh, where it's some of the people ask for the transcript of the uh, of the meeting, so they could they have yeah. their own translator uh, yeah. do it, and it was, it was it was interesting. Everybody, some of the people were upset, and they're like, "No, that's pretty normal." Um, how about Yasser Arafat? Arafat at the time was still classified a terrorist by the U.S. government. We had gotten in there to do an interview with him because from time to time he decided it was in his interest to do an interview with Western media. And the question was always, when are you going to meet him? You know, when's he going to show up? How many days are you going to sit here? I think we were in, where were we? I think we were in Khartoum. And suddenly we get a call for a, a middle of the night breakfast with Arafat. And it's a long table. I was way down the table from him. And we're dining and it's fine. And remember, at this time, well, even to this day, I guess, although I can't be sure, I'd have to look at the political statements. At the time in the Arab world, uh, among many countries and certainly among the PLO, Israel did not exist. It was not a country. It was not there. The most they would refer to it as was the Zionist entity. And no one interviewing uh, one of these folks could possibly acknowledge ever having been to Israel. We had two passports, each of us, the one that you used to get in and out of Israel and the one that you used for every place else because an Israeli stamp in the passport would kill you in the Arab world. Anyway, we're having this breakfast and it's terrific. And it's the middle of the night. And at some point, the sound man, sorry, guys, it's always the sound man, pipes up, oh, blood oranges. I haven't had those since I was in Israel. 
And it was like that old commercial for the brokerage where every action at the table stopped and no one said a word for what seems like a year. It was probably two seconds. And then conversation continued as if he had never made the statement. You would think he would have been more sensitive to that. <laughs> yeah, well, as I say, it's always the sound man. God love him. Gosh, okay. So now, how did you happen to get into the show Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives? Completely by accident. I had grown weary of network news. I, I saw that it was changing under my feet. At the time, I was line producer of Good Morning America, which means that subject to the executive producer, every third week, the show is yours, uh, which was great, except during that week, you'd get a total of like 12 hours sleep. Anyway, they came to me, the EP, one evening and said, tomorrow morning, th there's going to be a million dollar winner on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire Tonight? So you'll have him in the first half hour tomorrow. And that's the moment that I said to myself, Network News, as I know it has changed. Um, pardon me, my dog wants to go out. There you okay. go, Buff. Come on, you can do it or not. We'll see. Uh, anyway, Buffy may or may not go out. She'll tell no. us what she wants. To. Um, so I, I decided to leave Network News. And, and please understand, this isn't bias. It isn't fake news. It isn't any of that. It's just that the emphasis on story selection and such had changed in a way that I didn't want to be part of. Yeah. So bizarrely, I got a job in the home shopping industry. I became senior vice president and executive producer of what at the time was the number three home shopping network in America and quickly realized I didn't want to do that. If we're going to have any discussions of integrity, uh, okay, so. Um, I left and this was in Minnesota. So we're living in Minnesota. The good news is my daughter's in a question. We bought a horse farm. So, okay. So I figure I will try to create a production company or as well, which I did only to have an executive producer of a CBS show say to me, well, it's one thing to be a production company as in you have an answering machine that says this is page productions. It's another thing to be a production company and, and do things. And I wasn't doing things. I, I was um, desperately trying to get some work, but uh, it wasn't happening. Certainly. Sorry, Buff, you're outside. Certainly not from Minnesota in a world of New York and Hollywood. So uh, in kind of desperation, I called a friend of mine, Al Roker, who wasn't yet on the, or may have changed, but originally Al wasn't on the, the day, daily Today Show. He was on the weekend show, which I mm. co-created with a partner. So Al had worked for me. He also had a production company, still does. I called him up. I said, uh, I'm, I'm going broke. You got any work? And he said, yeah, I'm doing a lot of stuff for the Food Network. You want to do some of that? I said, sure. So he would subcontract stuff to me. Uh, and suddenly I was a food journalist. After a while, and among the things he subcontracted was an hour on diners, just kind of the history of diners. Uh, after a while, we agreed that uh, financially, I'd obviously do better off selling stuff to them myself. So I started pitching the Food Network. Unsuccessfully, I set a record for the number of pitches to which they said no. But the executive I was pitching was a nice lady and was encouraging. One day, I'm on the phone with her. This is either a Thursday or a Friday, late in the day. I'm in my basement office on the horse farm and I'm pitching and she's saying no and she's saying no and she's saying no. Finally, she says, don't you have anything else about diners? And I said, oh, yeah, I've been developing this thing called Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives. And she says, you know, that sounds kind of interesting. We have a development meeting Tuesday. Get me a one sheet. I'll write it up on Monday. So I hung up the phone, delighted that she had expressed interest, but I had one problem. No, I was not developing a show called Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. I had just made up the name on the spot and pulled it out of whatever part of my anatomy you, you wish to uh, visualize. So I spent the weekend making phone calls. Back then, you actually, the phones we had, you could talk to people on them. You, could, mm -hmm. you didn't have to text. So I called a bunch of people, and I, I put together a write-up. 
And shortly thereafter, they picked up Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives as a one-shot special. Mm -hmm. When the special rated well, then there was a development that they did not expect. They were trying to make Guy Fieri a star. He had won their first network, uh, their network star contest, I guess, year mm -hmm. two. And they wanted to keep him in the public eye and hoped to create a series for him. So they had asked a couple of big boy production companies, much more important entities than I, to come up with proposals for Guy. And they figured my special would keep him, you know, uh, on the air, people noticing him for in the interim. But it turns out they didn't like any of the proposals from the big boy companies. So very, very grudgingly, they commissioned Diners as a series while warning me, even after the first few episodes were rated well, that they didn't think there were enough restaurants in the U.S. for this to have legs beyond a couple of seasons. <laughs> So, so uh -huh. how many how many restaurants? <laughs> well, I, I did the first 11 seasons. So far, they've done, I left after that. They're up to season 30-something now. So I guess there were enough restaurants. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you don't get out of California or, or New York. New York. <laughs> you just don't, you, York. You just don't think there's anything in flyover there's, country. <laughs> there's also something else. I mean, look, the success or failure of uh, television programming is defined by Goldman's rule. Now, William Goldman won two Academy Awards as a screenwriter. He did Butch Cassidy, he did All the President's Men. He's one of the most noted screen doctors of the last 20 or 30 years. He passed away not that long ago. Anyway, he wrote a book called Adventures in the Screen Trade, in which he explained why studios do or don't pick up movies and mm -hmm. why movies do or don't do well if they're picked up or not. And Goldman's rule is very simple. No one knows anything. That's it. <laughs> so, so you start off this thing and you were not given much of a chance. You, you were told that you're, well, this will be here for just a little bit. And all of a sudden, yeah, and I, I'm proud to say that I think I created the most impactful program in Food Network history. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, a tremendous amount of its success, a massive amount of its success is due to Guy. Mm -hmm. But I will say uh, unabashedly uh, that he was extremely green. And I'm very proud of, of what I taught him. And the, oh, the show continues to roll. Yeah. What uh, about the show? What surprised you? Is there anything that surprised you about it? About the show? Yeah. Uh no, I, I the, well, yes. The one thing that surprised me at the time, and this was like 2006 or seven, was how precarious the state of the independent restaurant business was. Mm -hmm. I was surprised to begin hearing in season one from the restaurants we had saved from bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And that continued as long as I was associated with the show. I got to the point where uh, there's a barbecue restaurant in Kentucky in Lexington where my daughter would compete in horse shows. It got to the point where I, I couldn't go to that restaurant every time I went to town because they would just pile on my table and not take my money. Um, but it, it's a it, it, it's a concern that stays with me today. I mean, the pandemic killed a whole lot of independence. Oh my gosh, yes. And I am troubled by. I mean, obviously, there, there are much more important things to be troubled about in today's world. But on the food side, I'm deeply troubled by a culture, a country that would prefer to eat at homogenous chain restaurants mm -hmm. than spend the time and money at a place run by mom and pop mm -hmm. who are hiring local people who are making real food. Right. And, and that, I mean, it's real food. So much of what people eat today is simply reheated or microwaved. My, my, my daughter was graduating from Columbia University in New York. Mm -hmm. Plug for my daughter, and now she's gotten her MFA from there. So I have no money left. That's, but that's, that's where my wife went to school. It's a phenomenal school. They just say, give us all your money, and mm -hmm. in a few years, yeah. we'll give your daughter a piece of paper. Anyway, mm -hmm. at her undergraduate graduation, I was anointed by the family to be the one who had to go across the street to get 
breakfast sandwiches because it's New York and you have to have a bacon, egg and cheese sandwich or your back breaks and you're arrested. So I go across the street. There are two storefronts next to each other. One has this massive line coming out and down the street, people waiting forever. The one I went into was a bodega, a New York deli, no line. And there's a guy behind a grill making breakfast, uh, bacon, egg and cheese sandwich is the same way he has for, I don't know, 9,000, 10,000 years, whatever. I get my, my bacon, egg, and cheese sandwiches on these great New York rolls, and I leave, and the line at the other place remains down the street. The other place is Starbucks. Excuse me? I don't get it. I just don't get it. End of story. So in all those years, because you went through uh, a number of, of restaurants and, uh, and dives, were there any that that still stand out in your in your mind? Oh yeah, um, there were plenty that stood out in my mind. Uh, one of them, I include well, two of them I included in my recent book, uh, El Indio, a a perfectly generic Mexican American restaurant in San Diego. When I say perfectly generic, it's it's an everyday Mexican American restaurant, mm-hmm. and it embodied everything that everyday Mexican American food should be. Now, it had some additional wonderfulness. The family had owned it for 70 years, still does. And because at the time I was making television and this was incredibly important, they had a Rube, still do, a Rube Goldberg-esque tortilla making machine. And while critics of the quote authenticity of the place would say, but those tortillas aren't patted by hand, A, This machine was implemented 70 years ago by the owner of the place. And B, they may not pat those tortillas by hand, but they nixtamalized the corn themselves and made their own masa. And that doesn't happen anywhere. Um, There's a a hamburger stand in West Lafayette, Indiana, owned by a couple who bought it from his parents, and it's been there forever. And they're famous for... The Dwayne Purvis All-American. Purdue is just down the street. And Dwayne Purvis was an All-American football player back in the day. And this hamburger, this wonderful, terrific hamburger, comes topped with peanut butter, which we in America don't understand is a savory flavor and, and plays a large part in various Asian cuisines. But there's just some kind of attachment to this hamburger over the decades that really struck me. Um, there were there were there were any number of places, but each one of them had its own particular story. Yeah, yeah. So, David, as you're looking at the landscape, because now there are so many food shows. Mm-hmm. There's so I mean, it's just all the time. It seems like. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you what what kind of which shows stand out to you? Uh, there are, well, there I, are there right I, now. I, I'm dealing from a very narrow. Um, library because i don't watch a lot of food tv so much of it um turned into competition competition is pardon my french that ain't food that's that's a game show and if you want to run a game show that's fine so much of any kind of specialized tv has gone that route i mean tlc home of the 600 pound my 600 pound life used to be the learning channel and and nobody Nobody's, despite all of this talk of a 500 channel universe and specialized viewing, nobody's doing that. The Travel Channel now does uh, mostly uh, paranormal. You know, so it, it, it's a search for broad entertainment. Now, two things. A, I am told, though I have not watched them, that there is some really, really good food television streaming specifically on Netflix. Okay. And on CNN, the, the one series that I recently watched was Stanley Tucci's Romp Through Italy, which I thought was extraordinary on every level. Number one, TV is lawyerism. It's about spending fun time, mm-hmm. he said, misusing fun as an adjective, fun time with someone you want to hang out with. Well, I, I want to go eat food in Italy with Stanley Tucci. Number two, it was... So, to the best of my knowledge, accurate in terms oh, okay. of the factuality. And, you know, reality TV, uh, quite rightly, uh, gets criticized for being BS, for facts not mattering. 
uh, and for, you know, what people said being misedited to mean something else. I prided myself when I did diners on holding the show to the same standards I held my producers to when I ran the investigative unit at 2020. It had to be factual. Uh, best I can tell, Tucci was factual. Number two, what a wonderful exploration and education for so many Americans who don't understand that food is regional, not national, in almost every place. You know, we talk about the origins of Italian American food in the United States. Well, the origins of Italian American food in the United States are Sicily or uh, the southern portion of the mainland. They're not most of Italy. Basically, the food we develop here as Italian American was southern Italian food. And that's great. It's a terrific cuisine. And We've evolved it in mostly wonderful ways, but acknowledging the variety of foodways regionally in Italy created by the weather, the availability of local crops, the mindset of local people, I thought was just a stunningly good job. And they apparently he's been picked up for a second season. I can't wait to see it. Mm. Also, I'm 66, he's 60 or 61. Nobody at that age should be able to wear skinny jeans and a scarf like Stanley Tucci. <laughs> I mean, screw him, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get what you mean. I get what you mean. Uh, yeah, I, I like a lot of elastics in my uh, in my pants. Yeah, sweatpants were, were, were for a reason, okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, my, Pandemic. My are, it's, it's a big deal if I, if sure. I put on a pair of pair of pants with a belt it's it's a it's it's you know people go my kids it's a big my wife go it's go, go right that right down their diary like that dad wore yeah. my husband wore yeah so so um what do you see as far as do you cook at home oh yeah i love to okay cook at home. so how how do you get the best ingredients for yourself at home well you acknowledge that you generally can't if you're living a real life. I mean, let's face it. I live on a small tourist island in South New Jersey. I do not have access to the kind of produce I'd like to have fresh from a farm. So I chalk it up to I can get what I can get. On the other hand, uh, about 15 miles up the road is a terrific butcher on the mainland who uh, dry ages his own beef. That's mm -hmm. remarkable. I, I get that. I drive there and I spend more for that quality of food. Yes, we, we order produce from Misfits, which is hopefully better than average. But what you have to do, don't be a fanatic. Do your best to eat mm -hmm. good food that is as unprocessed as possible, unless you're eating those wonderful uh, ice cream sandwiches from Klondike that are going to be processed to hell, but damn well worth it. it, it, it I, I think my point is do your best. That's all. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. My, my uh, father-in-law used to, uh, before he passed away, he was a butcher. He had a, oh. a meat mark. He had a meat mark in the lower East side. Oh, and uh, kosher? Actually, no, it wasn't kosher. Uh, yeah. But it was, uh, it was actually very, he had a lot of celebrities come in. And actually, when you open up the, James Beard, never mentioned anyone. But if you open up a chapter in James Beard book mm -hmm. to the meat chapter, mm -hmm. it's it's the inside of the store. Oh, but see, <laughs> it, it's much more than the food provided. What yeah. what I love about my butcher or, or any great butcher is yeah. I like going there and saying, listen, I'm thinking about making this dish. What cup would you recommend and how should I handle it? Mm -hmm. That to me, when I lived in Northern Jersey, um, pretty much in, in the area chronicled by the Sopranos, I had a butcher on uh, Bloomfield Avenue heading, heading into Newark, who was an old line Italian butcher, knew his trade. I would call him up and say, hey, I want to do some rack of lamb. He'd say, come on down. He would haul half a lamb carcass out of the walk-in and cut my rack of lamb there. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That's we tend to overlook the expertise necessary or the expertise we should respect among the craftspeople who handle our food. Uh, we, we have a cheese store that popped up on this little island. Um, it, there's no secret. It's Long Beach Island, LBI. A lot of people come here. Anyway, uh, I was stunned at how good their selection is until I took a look online and realized this is their summer satellite from a place they run in northern Jersey catering to folks who commute to and from New York every day. The, the cheese that they bring in there will just put you on your behind. Yeah. It's, you know, you talk about good food. I'll go there to, to, get, to get my cheese for when I'm making cacio and pepe, for example. And it makes all the difference in the world. One of the things we've lost, there was a piece. I don't know where, where it was the other day. And it's funny because I came across something about it like two days ago as well. About how northern New Jersey, well, northern to central New Jersey, is the home of the United States flavor industry a bunch of chemical companies that spend all their time figuring out ways to make something taste like key lime pie rather than make bakers use key limes. Well, no, thank you. I want my baker using key lime. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know if you've ever been there <clears throat> uh, about two years, about three years ago. No, maybe more than that, about four years, five years ago. Uh, I was in uh, Iceland. I've been there. Yeah. The food is incredible there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was there. I, 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 was, I was there for the summit. Yeah. Oh, okay. With Megan okay. Gorbachev. Yeah. yeah. I had a terrible Yeah. Well, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Actually, we went to the hotel. Uh, not not that we're, well, Reagan didn't stay there, but where every, all the all the uh, U.S. embassy staff stayed right. at the, uh, what was something with an H? I can't remember now. I don't know. They put the, <clears throat> us media. I was 45 minutes away in some place. I, you know, oh, gosh. It was, and driving in the winter there is not. Is not well, they fun. bust us, but it well, was. Well, they bust us, yeah. yeah. It's yeah, all, you it, know, that's a weird country because when you come in, the, the, um, the duty free is on the way in, not the way out. Mm-hmm. And yeah. So that's how you buy alcohol. And did, did you yeah. find that they sell something called, oh, something death? Maybe oh. the Black Death. <clears throat> it was appropriately named. Yeah, you know, I can't remember, but I, it was just very interesting because even the, like you go into a small gas station, and there'd be somebody with a grill cooking up sausages and onions. I mean, just cooking them up, and uh, and because it was so expensive to uh, uh, to basically import stuff, uh, everything was local sourced. And yeah. I mean, you had rain there, you know, I mean, the the fish was like caught that day. Uh, all that stuff. It was uh, the food was. I, it was. Yeah. It was a. a, a uh, it was something I was not expecting, but it was a pleasant surprise. It makes such a difference too. And by the way, the parallel to that is the guy in the bodega cooking up the bacon, egg, and cheese. I sure. mean, there you are. In and in fact, there's there's a corollary to that. I was just reading a report. Convenience stores in America are more and more becoming restaurants, competing with quick service restaurants. Mm-hmm. They're even faster. They make a tremendous amount of food on site. That that's something people don't realize, and yeah. they're doing. Many of them are doing a very good job. Yeah, out out west here, we have some fairly large gas stations that I mean yeah. are are huge with with big food areas inside. And and you're right. I mean, a lot of that food is is made right there. Well, in Food Americana, I I, I profiled the sushi bar inside a gas station in Oklahoma. All right. Well, that's that's exactly where I want to go. I want to talk about your book. So, so, okay. so tell me, tell me, let's tell me what possessed you to to write a book, because I'm I'm in I'm in the middle of, of putting together a, a a webinar, and I've my wife says she's never seen me work so hard. Uh. <laughs> well, it was naivete about the difficulty of the process, but every television producer, and I've been one for forty some odd years now, thinks he has a book in him or she especially because writing for television is highly complicated and people don't realize it. You can't start a television story by just telling the story. You can't say it was a dark and stormy night and then Oedipus killed his father. You have to build a television piece around the audio and video that you have. So you're always writing 
just to slide people into an experiential event and out of it without them knowing and then into another experiential event. It is in many cases highly indirect writing. And at some point, almost every television producer says, God, I wish I could just sit down and say what happened. And that had been percolating in the back of my mind for quite some time. Uh, I'm one of these career changers, even though I've mostly been in television for a half century. Every few years, I move on to a different job within the industry because mm -hmm. I guess I get bored. Anyway, I looked up not that long ago and I said, you know, it's time for the book. Now, that was two and a half years ago. Uh, I made the mistake of picking a research intensive subject, i.e., I did a chapter on each of a dozen different kinds of food, give or take. Mm -hmm. The research required for each chapter was almost as much as the research required had I been doing an entire book on that topic. Mm -hmm. So without realizing it, I locked myself into a tremendous amount of work. It took two years, but I'm very happy with, with what I got. We've, uh, we were named a finalist in the International Book Awards. We just picked up a silver medal in another awards, and I'm embarrassed to say I don't remember which one. Uh, the fact is, um, I'm very happy with, with what how it turned out, and I'm actually writing another one now. Yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit about what's, what's, what's in the book. I, uh, you, you go through various American foods, I gather. So what, tell us about some of the foods. Yeah, well, the I, I want to hear more about the sushi restaurant okay, in, well, let's in a gas station sushi. in, in, the, the, in the, Oklahoma. The premise of the book is that we created an American cuisine out of bits and pieces of other countries and other cultures' foods. Sushi, for example, is now a completely American food as we eat it in the United States. A woman who is a top executive at the largest producer of prepackaged sushi in the U.S. told me that when she was in high school and she and her friends went out to grab lunch, it was a burger. For her, fr for her kids today, it's sushi. Now, mm -hmm. we took sushi from its relatively pristine um, Japanese roots. Mm -hmm. And as you do with any kind of food, we evolved it. We evolved it to fit the American palate. We made rolls bigger. We added more flavors to them. We added many more cooked ingredients like French fries. The place that I profile across from Dinker Air Base outside Oklahoma City actually attracts Oklahoma diners by deep frying their sushi rolls. They'll make an entire roll and then throw it in the deep fryer. Now, they'll also make any other kind of sushi that you want. My, 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 my daughter went to school in Oklahoma. Uh, Where? I got, I, I got um, asked to leave a couple of Oklahoma State Universities. Yeah, it was a Oklahoma University of Oklahoma. Yeah, I, I, I was asked to leave that one. I was also asked to leave Oklahoma State because I, I... It's hard to get kicked out of Oklahoma. What'd you do? Well, here's the deal. I, I went to school thinking that I would try to get on the radio, chase women, drink, and study. Now, I clearly only had time for three of the four. And once I got hired by WKY in Oklahoma City, boom. Uh, but then I mentioned I also got thrown out of Oklahoma State anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but this, this place is a perfect example of our Americanization of sushi. It's an American dish now. Now, you can also get sushi as it is uh, eaten in Japan. And by the way, sushi does not have anything to do with fish. Fish is in Japan, the most popular ingredient or topping, but the death, the word means vinegared rice. Sushi is about making things with vinegared rice. So uh, this whole, I don't like raw fish argument doesn't really legitimately apply to sushi, but that's one example. Um, pizza is another example of an American food that started out uh, in a different form in a different country. Pizza came to America with Southern Italians, mostly from Naples, coming here, immigrating in the 1800s, and then attempting to recreate the foods they knew. However, the wheat in the United States had a very different protein uh, percentage than the wheat in Southern Italy. The ovens in New York City were fired by coal 
as opposed to the onions and uh, onions ovens in Naples that were fueled uh, by wood. So right off the bat, pizza changed. It became crispier, less soggy. A, a true pizza napolitana, napolitano is actually wet, and many people order it. And if it's done right, they don't like it because that's not what they think pizza is. Anyway, once here, these immigrants discovered abundanza, the abundance of food that even the poorest people could afford. Whereas in Italy, if you didn't have any money, if you were one of these people who, who came here seeking a better life, the most you could ever hope to put on the cheapest dish you could make, which was pizza, would be maybe an anchovy or maybe a small piece of lard. So right off the bat, Italian food evolved into Italian American food, which is much more um, bounteous, much more invested in the availability of meat than was ever the case back in Italy. Um, the, talk about the bagel. The bagel existed in Poland as one of the few items Jews were allowed to sell by the government. And they would, Jewish peddlers would go out with long wooden sticks, kind of like dowels, that they would hang the bagels on, and, and that's how they sold them. When these immigrants got to the United States, they brought the concept of the bagel with them, but it evolved very quickly. It became bigger. While the outside remained crunchy, it became softer. And because of something that did not exist in Europe, the quintessential bagel lunch or dinner became bagel lox and cream cheese. Well, Jews in Europe, my grandparents' people, didn't eat lox because they didn't have lox or call it smoked salmon. There are differences between the two not worth going oh. into here. Anyway, smoked salmon reached New York after the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad which made it possible to bring salmon from the Pacific Northwest to New York. But there was no refrigeration. The only way yeah. to keep that salmon from spoiling was to immerse it in salt, which brined it. And by definition, salt brined salmon is lox. Now, okay. the cream cheese element, that was an accident, many say. The historians some disagree, but the story that I accept is that there was a farmer in upstate New York trying to duplicate French Neufchatel. He didn't quite get it. He got something he called cream cheese. The Breakstone Dairy Company, which was owned by a couple of Jewish brothers, started pushing it as an adjunct to traditional Jewish foods. Never mentioned bagels, but traditional Jewish foods in the Yiddish newspaper, the Forvitz, which translates into the forward, which still exists today. And uh, next thing you know, you got bagels, lox, and cream cheese. I mean, each yeah. of these items <clears throat> has a distinct evolutionary history. Now, what you've got with bagels is even more interesting because then a Jewish family, the Lender family in New Haven, Connecticut, figured out how to freeze bagels, leased the first automatic bagel making machine from the guy who had invented the rollaway ping pong table. And it was that blander, softer, more generally inviting, except to Jews like me, bagel that swept the country, making the bagel an American dish, not a New York Jewish dish. And today, because foodways continue to evolve, now you have artisanal bagel. Mm -hmm. bagel yeah. Stories, so, so one of the things where I remember people. I was just going to say, people are returning to the earliest roots, making bagels by hand. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I enjoy on my bagel, and it's hard to get, is belly locks. Oh, but see, that's what a dish. Belly locks is, is the original locks. It's salted, not smoked. Most of what people order is, in fact, smoked salmon. And the thing with belly locks is it's so salty. I usually, when I have Nova, smoked salmon, cream cheese, and a bagel, I go for an everything bagel. Can't do that with belly locks because of all the salt in belly locks. Yeah, you can yeah. go for an onion bagel or a plain bagel, but you got to know your bagel and locks combo to get it right. <laughs> well, and, you I, know, love, I love salt, so it doesn't. I, I'm a saltaholic. I just like 
I, very few people know belly locks. Yeah, yeah. But it's, remember, it's... see, Nova was more expensive than belly. When really? Okay. Years. And I remember my status conscious grandmother, when my grandfather went out to get some locks, yelling, don't forget the Novi. That's what <laughs> she called it. She wanted Nova because that's what rich people ate. Uh, all right. You know, I talked to Mel Brooks about locks for the book. Okay. And he, he grew up very poor in Brooklyn. Mm. And he said, like, we would get a little piece of locks once a week. That's how expensive it was. Much more expensive than, for example, uh, whitefish. Or, um, I'm, I'm going to blank, the, uh, the, the herring. Herring was the cheapest um, smoked uh, fish food that, that Jewish immigrants could eat. You could get two days out of, uh, out of a herring because the first day, you would rub it on a piece of bread and the fat would flavor the bread. And that was meal number one. The second day you ate the fish. <laughs> well, that sounds very interesting. So, uh, David, if somebody wanted to follow you and or get in touch with you, how would they do that? Well, I've got a Facebook page for Food Americana. Okay. I've got an Instagram page for Food Americana. Uh, now, you want to want to we'll have both those. Li- we'll have both those links in the, in the, in the show notes. Terrific. And if if they want to help support my daughter's education, they can go to Amazon.com or any online bookseller and pick up a copy. That's right. I think I think uh, there's a lot. It's it's. I think it's it's interesting reading. Uh, definitely. Uh, Thank you. About the stuff that that we eat and to know more more about it. Uh, of the of all the things that we put in our mouth on a daily basis. Yeah. So, uh, we don't know enough. We don't know enough, and uh, just the history of stuff is sometimes just fun to know. So all right. Well, David, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, it's Thank you very, for having me. It's been, been great. Very pleasurable and enjoyable. I learned a lot about food, uh, about the uh, TV business, about the food networks and all that stuff. And uh, just a, a, a just a pleasure, pleasurable way to spend an hour with you today. Same here. Thank you very much. This is Oris, the official old guy at oldguytalkstome.com. Remember, it's all about creating a kick-ass life for yourself and those you love. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. And If you don't like me, give me a bad review. I don't care. I love my trolls. I I, want to keep you happy. So until next time. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. If you like what you heard and learned, then be sure to do three things. One, subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Two, share this with someone who may need to hear it also. And it may be your significant other. And three, review it give me a good review. If you didn't like it, give me a bad review. I don't care. Just review me. And be sure to get my free video on three ways to get laid more frequently without begging. Opt in at oldguytalks.com. Don't be that guy that just takes in the information. Take action. Without action, you're not going to get the results you want.